Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the land on which I am this evening, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Australian Academy of Science is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of the country. I am Nancy Pritchard, Director of International Programs and Awards at the Australian Academy of Science. I am delighted to be here for the 2022 Haddon Forrester King Medal and Lecture. I warmly welcome everyone here to the Shine Dome and those you, that join us online. To continue our proceedings, I would now like to hand over to Professor Malcolm Sambridge, Vice President and Secretary for the Physical Sciences of the Australian Academy of Science. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so I too am delighted to be here tonight to present the Haddon Forrester King Medal and hear, of course, the lecture from Professor Richard Henley. So a few items before we get started. So for those of you who want to join the conversation on Twitter this evening, you can do so using the hashtag HenleyLecture. Um, and for those of you who wish to ask questions of Professor Henley, you can do so at the conclusion of his lecture, both online and in the theatre. So the Academy Awards for 2024, a bit of a plug, are now open. And I encourage everyone to think about nominating a deserving scientist for recognition. I'd especially like to encourage the nomination of women and underrepresented groups um, for these career awards at all levels. And if you look at the Academy website, you'll see details of them. Uh, so moving on now to the Haddon Forrester King Medal and Lecture. This award is sponsored by Rio Tinto, as we all know, and is one of the Australian Academy of Sciences most prestigious career awards. It's for lifelong achievement and, out, and an outstanding contribution to science. The award is made in honour of the contributions of the late Haddon Forrester King, whose work applied the geological and related sciences to the search of mineral deposits in Australia and elsewhere. This award is made to a scientist in Australia or overseas recognising original and sustained contributions to earth sciences of particular relevance to the discovery, evaluation and exploitation of mineral resort deposits, including the hydrocarbons. The Academy is grateful to the friends and family of Haddon King, who supported the establishment of this award after he passed away in 1990. We're also grateful for the ongoing support of Rio Tinto, making it possible for the Academy to celebrate the work of great scientists with the Haddon Forrester King Medal. Before we get to Professor Henley's lecture, to say a few words on behalf of Rio Tinto, I'd like you to welcome Dr. John Kilroe. John. Oh, thank you, Malcolm. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and represent Rio Tinto uh, with, this, with the award. Um, I've got a script and uh, Rio Tinto doesn't like it when I deviate too far from the script, but given my assumption will be correct that there's not too many Rio Tinto people here tonight, I'll, I will deviate a little bit. Um, so I, I had the pleasure, I, I, I was in Brisbane and on my return to Perth, so you know, passing through Canberra uh, was a pretty easy, uh, easy thing to do. So. Um, uh, I, I arrived last night and um, Professor Henley invited me to spend a bit of time at the, um, at the physics department at ANU this afternoon. And um, they are doing some work for, for Rio Tinto, which I was aware of. But, um, you know, I, I just want to say thank you very much. It was a real eye-opener. Um, I know there's been a lot of work done by the professor on, you know, copper and gold. Um, but it was also really pleasing to see a lot of the other work that's been done uh, through the department that's, um, that's helping Rio Tinto along with, with various other companies. Um, so just as an example, um, fantastic instrumentation, um, amazing people 
extremely enthusiastic um, and try to convey um, messages to me in terms of, with respect to what they're actually doing was a little bit above me, but um, I, I, got a, I, got a, I got the gist of some of it. Um, what I did take away though is, you know, iron ore is, is, is a, a big commodity for Rio Tinto, um, generates a lot, of, a lot of value for Rio Tinto as it does for a lot of companies and for Australia. Um, but CO2 emissions associated with iron ore, uh, particularly the steel making part, is, is huge. And uh, really amazing to see the work that's been done um, by, by the department with input from Professor Henley that looking at ways to reduce CO2 emissions, um, particularly with respect to what we call scope three emissions with, with the smelters, um, uh, where they produce, uh, produce steel. Uh, CO2 emissions are huge uh, in that regard. But that, that's transforming um, and they're moving away from what we call blast furnaces to arc furnaces, which are a different type of, of furnace, where the CO2 emissions are dramatically reduced. And as a result, um, you need a certain iron ore product in order to be able to put into those furnaces um, to help with those CO2 emission reductions. And the work that the department's doing with input from Professor Henley is, is absolutely fantastic. And I think that's helping Rio Tinto along with a lot of other companies down that path of CO2 reduction, which is so important for for uh, for the world, not not just uh, not just for Rio Tinto, but but for everyone. So, um, just a different aspect with respect to some of the work that's been done by Professor Henley, and and certainly from a Rio Tinto perspective, greatly greatly appreciated. So now I'll quickly re revert to to the script. Um, I will first comment is um, 150 um, anniversary for for Rio Tinto in March this year, which for me is a very proud moment, and. Um, it does contribute to the, um, the ongoing support um, with respect to advancing technical and scientific endeavors. So um, really important in that regard. So Rio Tinto is a proud sponsor of the Haddon Forrester King Medal, uh, one of Australian Academy of Sciences prestigious career awards for lifelong achievement and outstanding contribution of, of science. The award is made in honor of the contributions of the late, late Haddon Forrester King who joined Rio Tinto's corporate ancestor, Zinc Corporation, as the chief geologist in 1946. Uh, then became director of exploration for CRA in 1962 until his retirement in 1970, where he continued to consult until 1986. So that, that does have special significance for myself, who, who is involved um, and, and looks after exploration uh, for Rio Tinto. So um, uh, a, a similar career path for, for myself, so I can, I can particularly relate to that. So the award recognises original and sustained contributions to earth and related sciences of particular relevance to discovery, evaluation and exploitation of mineral deposits. So congratulations to Professor Henley, uh, who for over 50 years has been a leader in the development of understanding how economic deposits of metals, especially copper and gold, were formed within large scale hydrothermal systems in volcanoes and mountain belts. So I'm not going to turn this into a geology lecture and I'm not going to explain um, everything to do with that particular statement. Um, what I will say though is uh, the significance of copper, um, I've alluded to iron ore, we read a lot in the press about battery metals, um, particularly lithium and, and nickel, um, but I think what's understated is the significance of copper. Um, for every, every tonne of, of, of nickel or lithium, um, there's enormous, vast, vast volumes of copper that's required in order to make that possible. So the battery industry can't, can't evolve without, without copper, so copper is a fundamental commodity in that regard. Um, in Rio Tinto, we contribute a lot of exploration dollars to, to the finding of new copper deposits, so the work that Professor Hanley's done um, has been a significant contribution to that. Um, should also be acknowledged that Professor Henley's contribution goes beyond, beyond copper and also, also applies to gold. And with respect to copper and gold, he has been very closely associated with, with significant copper and gold discoveries in, in PNG and Indonesia. Um, there is further work that Professor Henley has been involved with. Um, for example, the understanding of the role of high temperature mag magmatic gas reactions with rock forming minerals. Um, as a principal controller in the generation of porphyry copper deposits. And once again, I'm not going to go into the detail as to exactly how that helps the industry, but I can assure you that it's an important component. So a highly distinguished career indeed, major contributions, copper gold, and, and more recently evolving into the, into the iron ore space as well. 
So I, I can certainly appreciate the enormity of Professor Henley's contribution. So on behalf of the industry, especially the exploration sector, I thank Professor Henley for the contributions and congratulations on winning the award. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and it's now my great honour to present the 2022 Haddon Forrester King Medal to Professor, Professor Richard Henley. And I'm going to call Richard Vic up to the stage. They're difficult to get out of. Now going to embarrass you even more. Um, so now it's my pleasure to read out the citation for Dick. So for over 50 years, Professor Richard Henley has been a leader in the development of understanding of how economic deposits of metals, especially copper and gold, were formed within large-scale hydrothermal systems in volcanoes and mountain belts. The fundamentals that he derived have provided the basis of exploration for epithermal through to orogenic gold deposits. The practical uh, chemistry of fluids in active geothermal systems and many follow-up research programs around the world. He has been acknowledged for his direct contribution to a number of major discoveries, including the giant Ladlulam uh, gold deposits in Papua New Guinea and the Ontu copper gold in the deposits in Indonesia. In the last two years, he has led the recognition of high temperature magmatic gas reactions with rock forming minerals as the principal control on the generation of porphyry copper deposits. He is currently focused on application of X-ray micro CT scanning to derive new and detailed understanding of water rock interaction chemistry and the properties of rock materials. Congratulations, Dick. I invite you now to join me on the stage and deliver your lecture. Well, I want to thank uh, Malcolm and John um, for their kind words, and then to follow that up with uh, some broader uh, areas of thanks um, with respect to this evening. The first, of course, is to Rio Tinto and to the Haddon King family for their continued interest in mineral deposit research uh, applied to mineral exploration and to mining. This field has expanded enormously since I entered it in the 1960s, for heaven's sakes, at a time when Haddon King was leading a very highly successful exploration for commodities from iron ores through aluminium uh, in, in northern Australia through to copper. I also want to thank the Academy and all those involved in awarding me this medal. In particular, I want to thank Nancy Pritchard, where are you? Just, just there, and Malcolm for making this actually happen. Because I think all those of you who actually know me will realize I'm not really a medal person. So yeah, thank you for yeah, getting this thing going. Uh, my acceptance really, though, is, and I'm, I'm genuine about this, focused on all the really good people that I've had the pleasure to work with over the last 50 years or so. Many became lifelong friends, but sadly, some are not with us. I, I won't mention the names, but I think about how I might tackle research problems sometimes by actually thinking about having a conversation with them. I also want to thank the Research School of Physics. Tim Senden is here and Mark Naxted, because they provided a delightful research environment uh, now for someone who should have been retired many decades ago. Um, and of course, I want to thank all of you who have made the trip here, some from quite some distance, including from Womboyne, 
just outside of town and particularly the Womboyne Table Tennis Club. I also want to thank my wife Meg. For 60 years we've been together and I wouldn't be here if she hadn't been the support person both for me and the family. So I'm a little bit emotional and I think this matter <laughs> belongs to you. <laughs> okay. That all said, uh, better get on with the, with the lecture that you've, you've come from. Okay. First thing to say is that we're going to deal with the simple physics of the world's most deadly volcanoes. Now, that might seem to be a very strange topic uh, around a metal that's related to mineral exploration and, and, and mining. But I think as we go along, you might see what the connection is. It sort of turns the tables because often uh, people who are talking about their research uh, in the geosciences are asked, what good does it do for exploration? Right? Um, and I actually say, well, actually, it may or it may not, um, but we'll try. And if you ask me a specific exploration question, then I'll try to work on that. But in this particular case, what I'm going to do is turn the tables and see what information, detailed um, exploration of mineral deposits does for understanding a major world issue, which is why do we have volcanoes, how do they work, and why do they explode? January the 15th last year, I don't know if you remember seeing this eruption as it started in Tonga. Um, this, the, you'll see that the NASA satellite pictures and the Japanese satellite pictures were there on your screens and you could get them from the newspapers, but actually none of them um, told you what the scale was or the time scale. <laughs> Um, so uh, we'll rectify that uh, with apologies to the French um, because this is a moment about 45 to 50 meter, minutes into the eruption itself, 50 minutes after the initial explosion, which is recorded seismically. And the, the diameter of that, um, that plume, because this is a mushroom cloud that's developing, is about 350 kilometers. So we're thinking about uh, speed scales of about 110 kilometers an hour, probably faster at the beginning, and then the, the eruption continued. So the Tonga eruption was a big explosion, tsunamis everywhere, etc., followed by a sustained uh, eruption of material uh, to form this mushroom cloud. And my task tonight is to explore how and why that happened. Uh, because it actually turns out that if you talk to volcanologists and other scientists in general, uh, they are very coy about uh, tackling that particular question of the how and the why uh, of volcanic explosions. Um, so now you know now you, you know that I am a physicist and not a geologist. Um, physicists are allowed to tackle these big questions um, and, ha and make some intelligent guesses along the way. We hope. I also want to say I'm going to have the cardinal sin of, show, of providing you far too much information and too many slides. Um, and if that goes into the wine hour, well, so be it. Uh, <laughs> um, but of course, this is a very general multidisciplinary topic, and we need to touch on, on a lot of different things. So in so doing, I shall probably gloss over things which professionals in those disciplines would, would regard as, as sacrosanct. Um, but we need to pull the story together and then start thinking about how we can, we can test things or learn, learn more about these things. So this little guy down here uh, is thinking all about uh, what is to come. First thing I thought I'd, I'd do is to uh, let you know uh, how we managed to get here, or more particularly I uh, managed to get here. Because the first thing was that, that I started my geology degree in 1965. And I'd never done geology before, but it seemed like a good idea. Um, and in the first few lectures at King's College in London, they started to talk about things called volcanoes. And I had no idea what they were talking about. 
because the southwest of England is not noted for its volcanoes. So a, a couple of us got together uh, who were in the same boat and said, well, we better go and have a look at some in the summer. So we actually set up a Royal Geographic uh, uh, Society expedition to map in the north of Iceland. And on the way there on the boat, we had the pleasure of going past the developing island of Surtsey, which is what you see here. Here is where seawater is hitting hot lava and exploding periodically all the time. And I want you to notice the small scale of it relative to what we're going to talk about later on. So I'm probably one of the few living people who actually saw this thing in eruption all that time ago. From there, we went to the north of Iceland, and I saw my first geothermal field, which was having its first, first drilling up there. This is called the Kraftler geothermal field, which is now uh, in production. And I, I, I don't know if this was deliberate, but you can see steam coming out of the top of my head. Right. Now, this may have set the scene by boiling my brain, um, but um, it did seem a bit uh, apocryphal at the time. And then uh, the following year, I was in British Columbia for the summer, exploring for porphyry copper uh, deposits in the, in the Canadian bush. So I started to get familiar with some of these large things, which were only then just beginning to be, called, be, be recognized as a major uh, resource. <laughs> um, so then there followed, the followed a period of about uh, six or eight years um, when I got involved, because we, we, we moved to Dunedin um, and got involved with looking at the gold deposits in the South Island and figuring out how they were related actually to the uplift of mountain ranges. So Mount Cook, for example, is going up at about a metre per year, but it's eroding down at the same time as well, so a fairly steady state sort of thing. And so we became aware, because of, of past experience, of, of what were the fluids doing during the, the uh, uplift of these uh, mountain ranges, and could they be the source of gold, transport of it, and, and deposition. So we did that, and it was particularly interesting at that time because uh, plate tectonics was still only being mentioned in hushed tones. People didn't believe it, uh, or weren't familiar with it, or un uncomfortable with it. Um, so the idea uh, that, that mountain ranges could move at the rate that we had actually measured, the New Zealanders had measured over 100 years, was anathema, uh, certainly to the Europeans. So the, uh, uh, the paper was rejected three times, um, and eventually published. So we got there. But after that, I moved in 1978 to the geothermal fields of the Talpo zone. So, this is a geothermal well, and they're just opening it up, and there goes the steam water mix from about 1,500 metres down to a 60 degree geothermal reservoir, now in production. 400 tonnes per hour, so big things happening that you don't often get to see. And I think it's seeing these things operate which turns your mind to think about energy and power and the rates at which things actually happen. So it set the sea very, scene very nicely. So what is a volcano? So excuse me a second while I have a, a wet. I might even pick up my notes. So the first thing you have to do in, in, when you're tackling a problem like eruptions is figuring out where, what, is the, what is a volcano. Okay, and, you, and I'll give you some examples like, there we go, uh, hit the world map with the red dots on it are where all the known or recently active volcanoes are. There are several thousand. At any one time, there are probably 200 or so in eruption. And we have magnificent um, uh, monitoring networks for these things now. The two I'm going to principally talk about are the Pinatubo eruption in 1991 um, in the Philippines, which you probably remember, and the Tonga eruption, which of course was only just a year uh, ago. So I'd like you to bear in mind that there's a lot of these things. They're not 
uh, idiosyncrasies of the earth sciences. And they are related, of course, to various aspects of plate tectonics. So we see them forming belts where we have subdu subduction zones, but they're also dotted a place around in some other places, such as in Central Africa, where they're tapping directly into the underlying mantle region. This is what you mostly think of, or what the media mostly think of, when they tell you about a volcano. It's the time when the, the journalist always tells you that something was spewing. And I think that's the only time they use the word spewing on, on the, the news programs. It's spewing lava. So you go, oh, here we go again. This is the Canary Islands one in 2021. And yes, it's very spectacular. But red hot lava itself is actually not too much of a problem unless you've built your beach house next to it. Okay, but uh, what is more important are things like this. Most volcanoes are defined by the massive release of reactive volcanic gases. This is an example, St. Augustine volcano in 2006. And what you see, of course, is the classic cone of a volcano sticking up out of the sea and jet, a jetting of ash and gas through up into the stratosphere where it spreads out and nowadays they call them umbrella clouds because mushroom clouds has a different connotation. So we're going to pursue this just a little bit. Right. Here we go. First of all, volcanic gases tend to hover around similar kinds of con con uh, concentrations of major gases. The major gases are water which is a greenhouse gas, of course, uh, about 91 weight percent. Usually these things are given as molecular percent, but I thought people might be more happy with weight percent. Carbon dioxide, about one weight percent. Sulfur dioxide, quite a lot, seven weight percent. And hydro hydrogen chloride as about one percent. The volcanoes uh, sometimes have been called into question for their contribution of CO2 into the atmosphere, but it actually turns out that they only produce about 1.4% of the total CO2 emissions. And if you think about that figure, it tells you something about the human contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere as being rather substantial. Now, in it, mostly uh, volcanic gases have been monitored by sampling on site, which is pretty difficult for some places, particularly if the thing is actually in an eruptive state. So we can only really uh, directly sample uh, gases if you can actually get up to them in your full protective gear. And I was fortunate to, to work a bit with, with Werner Gigenbach, who, who actually developed the very fine art of how to collect and analyze these, uh, these uh, type of of gas discharges. But nowadays we have uh, other me means of doing things, like for example satellites, uh, particularly developed through the 1990s to measure sulfur dioxide emissions from flue gases. Well, of course, they can also do volcanoes as well. We now also have drone technology being developed over here, maybe just see one. Um, and I'm involved with some people at Volcano in Italy in looking at the gas chemistry um, uh, that one could monitor through using a drone. And then there's also remote sensing uh, methods whereby you can point, point an instrument at a, a gas flux um, some distance away um, and get some mostly ratios of gases, but they're all quantitative methods that enable us to know a bit more about what this stuff is that's being pumped into the atmosphere. And realizing, of course, that this has been happening since the beginning of the Earth, and is largely responsible uh, for the build-up of the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans and the interactions that then took place with respect to the, the developing continents. So there's a lot of follow-on type things that can go from there. But my main thing is, how do we look inside one? If you even contemplate a volcano like this, how on earth will you go and look to see inside, to see what processes are happening? How are the gases going through? Where do they come from? That kind of, kind of thing. Well, you might actually go and look at these things called porphyry coppers. 
Now let me explain the word porphyry. When I showed you the Canary Islands lava, we can translate lava to mean a thing called magma. When, it, when lava is underground, we'll call it magma. Okay? Now if that magma has large crystals in it, then we'll call it a porphyry. Now that comes because there's a particularly nice porphyry on Cleopatra's needle in London that the Brits stole from Egypt. So there's a lot of history uh, in some of these things. But the early porphyry copper deposits seem to be associated with these kind of porphyritic rocks. But a lot of the more modern ones don't tend to necessarily have that, but the, but the term uh, is, is maintained. Now what you can see is that those blue spots a lot of them are following the young uh, volcanic arcs, particularly down the western side of the Americas uh, and through the Philippines and uh, PNG. There are others which are not directly associated with any of those modern subduction zone volcanoes. Um, so down here we have some from Orange, which is not too far from us, uh, the very large um, Ridgeway and Cadia uh, copper gold deposits that were discovered back in the 80s and 90s and which are now uh, being, being uh, extended. And they are, um, I think, about 450 million years old. Some of the other ones, such as Grassberg in Indonesia, which we're going to talk about, is only 2.7 to 3.1 million years old, which isn't very long ago. It's before, before I was a boy, um, but it's not that long ago. And so it hasn't eroded so much as, say, the, the ones up in, uh, in, in uh, Orange. Another one I'll mention and show you a photograph of is one called El Salvador in Chile, which is about 40 million years old. So these deposits with their similar characteristics and resources have been developing by common geological processes through time. And as we shall see from here, they can be related directly to volcanic activity. Now we've known this for some time. Uh, one of the original pieces of work that was done was the porphyry copper deposit at El Salvador in Chile. And here's a picture of it. And you can see the kind of residual mound, which was the interior of the original hosting volcano. That work was, was published by Lou Gustafson, who was on the staff here at uh, ANU uh, back in the early 1970s. Uh, and then. Uh, move back to the States. Another person who's been very prominent in recognizing this is a geologist called Dick Silito, who is, again, still active, um, who's probably seen every porphyry copper on Earth, um, but he was able to put together a composite diagram here of a volcano and some of the features that you would see if you were, were digging into, into one and showed how they related to volcanic things. So there's lava flows, there's ash deposits, there's all of these kind of things which he, he could see. Scarns where the, the host rock, um, I can't point to that, uh, where the host rock has been baked by the intrusions which were roughly the same sort of time. Um, so uh, we knew about this. There tends to have been, been a, a tendency to forget this, this relationship, um, but uh, I think we're going to reinforce it in a mo. All right, now volcanoes themselves, how do they work? Well, you're all familiar with this kind of diagram of a subduction zone, and you know that in this region, as things get hot and water is released from the descending slab, so you generate magmas. And those magmas are, magmas are buoyant with respect to the, the lower part of the crust. So they start to move up. The scale there is about 20 uh, kilometers. So here we can have a, a, a cross section sketched of what the, a volcano might look like. It would be made up of these orange blobs, which are here, are mafic magmas. Mafic is a particular term, we can call them black magmas for the time being, and they release H2O, CO2, SO2 and HCl. We see those gases coming out of Hawaii 
This is Kilauea in 2018 with that brown smoggy VOG where sulfur dioxide is interacting with particles to give you the brown smoggy uh, compounds. Um, in these cases, CO2 is actually higher than we see around the arc volcanoes. So we can draw that cross section and then move on. And now we're wanting to be interested rather more in the upper part of the volcano. And this was some, uh, some work that was done with my friend Alex McNabb in the early 70s. Alex was an applied mathematician who, uh, who was able to do mathematical analysis of convective fluid flow and the rise of buoyant uh, gases. And we worked out that, that whereas the popular notion always was, the popular assumption always was that the fluids involved in geologic processes were liquids, we said that the, distance, that the shape of these deposits and the information that we got from them in fluid inclusions, isotopes, etc., said that it had to be a gas phase. So a, a water dominated gas phase. And this was relatively well uh, accepted um, and, uh, through, through uh, time, although the picture has been clouded a little bit some, by uh, uh, some fluid inclusion interpretations. Now, water, of course, is a condensable gas. And uh, so that's probably what it looks like. A uh, misty day like yesterday in Canberra when you have about two volume percent of liquid water droplets to form the fog or the mist. And that's coming through the fractures uh, that are going up through the volcano. But 98% of it is a gas phase. So we can consider that the dynamics of the system are those of a gas phase. Down here, we, ha we still ha we have the mafic deep sourced uh, magmatic gas, which actually some friends of mine are now able to separate from other gases. Those are hot enough at 1, 1,100 degrees to actually melt parts of the crust that they go through. And they can therefore generate buoyant bodies of more silicic um, magma material, which itself can move up and it can release gases in, it, in its own right. So things begin to get pretty complicated uh, up there. Terry Murner is back there and he and I published on this back in 2020 by really going back to the first principles of uh, uh, the interpretation of fluid inclusions. Now if you're going to move a gas, or a liquid for that matter, through a volcano, you've actually got to provide permeability. You actually have to provide a network of cracks for it to go through. So if you can understand a volcano, you actually have to also understand how are you going to maintain such a system of cracks. And what the, the principal reason uh, for it is that we have this pressurized gas coming up and impacting on the rock mass, which is itself confined. If it increases the pressure on that rock mass by the tensile strength of the rock, then the rock will break and form a brittle fracture which of course is then permeable, so then the gas can be released. And we see this uh, in the network of fractures that, that actually typify these things called porphyry copper deposits. So we have down at the bottom here, we have the continual pumping of high pressure, high temperature gas, which is coming up through the, through the crust and impacting on the, the rock mass, mass that uh, it's trying to get through. Now we can go in detail in, into, into this by going to particular porphyry copper deposits. And we had the, the really nice opportunity to have a, a, a long distance relationship with a guy called Clyde Lays, who was with um, uh, the, the company up there, Freeport Mac, Mac Moran, who had, uh, who had a very interest, a very uh, keen research uh, relationship. And so he was able to provide uh, uh, material both from the porphyry copper open pit, which is here in the highlands of uh, Irian Jaya in Indonesia, and from the deep drill core. 
because they've drilled very deeply, intensely, and so have a, a lot of information about, about things. Here's the distribution of copper in, in this deposit, a cross-section down through the middle of that open pit. And you can see on the right the mass of crisscrossing fra crossing fractures now fi filled with silica and other things, quartz and other things. So clearly the fluid medium was trying to keep this thing permeable all the time. It was putting pressure on it uh, to do that. But more particularly, if we look here, uh, there's a clear demarcation line between the nothing copper and the higher copper. And this actually was a, a, a volcanic vent nearly two kilometers deep, which blew up around about 2.7, 3 million, let's say 3 million years ago, and therefore provided a permeable channel through to the surface. It was filled with rubble from the walls and so on, but it was a permeable mass of material that was then open to any gas that was generated uh, deeper in the system. More particularly, Grasberg actually retains in the high mountains, uh, it retains some evidence of what the surface was like. And what can be mapped out was a thing called a Mar Lake, which is a shallow lake, probably with sulfatara gases coming through it. And it might have looked like this, which is Lake Miki in Turkey. And in the middle of it is a late volcano that's come up through the middle. And lo and behold, here's a late dike that came up through the thing mostly after the mineralization. So we've got a cross section of a volcano three million years ago, right? um, which is a, a good place to start um, thinking about things. Now we took a closer look uh, at some of the core material that was sent to us. And we actually became aware uh, that there were lots of fractures through this, this thing. And you can see them uh, here, traversing things, which contained the purple colored thing called calcium sulfate, or anhydrite, and the orange things, which is the copper sulfides. So there was a direct spatial and temporal relationship between the copper sulfides and the uh, calcium sulfates. This is it in more detail over here. We can see calcium sulfide, uh, copper sulfides there, and here's our uh, anhydrite uh, material. Anhydrite, incidentally, is very closely related to the stuff on wall boards around your home. Um, so it's a lightweight calcium sulfate material. And this generated, it was generated, we could, we could surmise, by the reaction between gas and rock, which is trying to seal the fractures. And if they seal the fractures, then the gas pressure goes up and you make another hydraulic fracture. So the whole thing is, is uh, self-sustaining. But the idea of gases reacting directly with rock materials was well known in industrial chemistry, but really wasn't very well known uh, in um, uh, uh, geological sciences. So we had to actually do it. So we did it and published this in 2015. This is a cluster of anhydrite crystals growing on a calcium silicate mineral. Uh, this one was done at 800 degrees, and we've done it at 600 degrees only at one bar pressure, so we didn't put pressure into the, into the equation uh, very much at all. But apart from its beauty, uh, it showed us that you formed this calcium sulfate really very fast when you reacted sulfur dioxide with a calcium-bearing silicate. The other interesting thing about it, um, and I don't think I included the equation, is that when you do this, you also produce hydrogen sulfide. You can't stop that. So now you have a gas coming through, and it's dropping copper in the veins. So the copper must have been in the gas. So now let's think, if we've got copper coming up in these veins, and all of a sudden it starts seeing some hydrogen sulfide, and the two go, bingo, I'm going to form a sulfide really very quickly because sulfides have very low solubilities in anything. So this was a, a bit of a, a, a breakthrough, and 
when we go back to Grasberg, we can now look at the distribution of anhydrite down through our cross section, and we see the high values uh, within the breccia filled vent uh, of, of the volcano. Okay, so we can now think of active volcanoes a bit differently. We can think of them as cracked up, gas filled sponges with highly reactive gas, progressively cementing cracks and pores with salts. Yes, sodium chloride is another one of the salts which can try and, and, and close up your fractures. And that throttles the flux through to the surface. And it's at that point, because from the mineral deposit and others, we can see the interior of a volcano, we can now start thinking about why they might blow up. The problem, of course, is, is, is that um, the salts and, and, and anhydrite are very soluble, so that the moment uh, it rains or there's drilling fluid around, you might dissolve all of that evidence. So we tend to call them ghost minerals, but we know that they are there if we go into deep drill core and, and, and look for, for them. Anhydrite is abundant in all of the porphyry coppers, uh, there's one where you don't tend to see it, but I think it's probably because it's been dissolved late. All right. So volcanoes, as well as what goes through them, are also defined by their explosivity. And you all know, and have probably been, many of you, to Pompeii, and so you will realize that there was the Pompeii eruption in 79 CE. And it was described by Pliny the Elder and Pliny the, the Younger. So we know quite a lot about well, what happened. But what we don't know is why do they explode at all? If we've just got gases going through that are managing to sustain the flow through fractures, why should they blow up? So we better have a look at that. Now Hugh O'Neill will recognize this place because we camped down here, just about down here, a few years ago. Open from the side. Yeah. So it was a good place not to be at that point, wasn't it, Hugh? Yeah. <laughs> and you all know about the Krakatoa uh, eruption and the devastation. Uh, it was the first one to be reported in Europe because the cable had just been put through to, uh, to Indonesia. So that, um, uh, there was excitement. There's an eruption in Indonesia and the Royal Society immediately sent an expedition to try and find out uh, what had happened. So um, uh, we learned a bit more about that. Okay. So how do these things happen? And this is where we come to the simple physics and take you all back to your school days of the old, the good old fashioned gas laws, whereby you remember pressure times volume equals a constant. And if you, pre if you plot pressure against volume, you get this kind of curve, right? So um, as you decrease the volume, so the pressure goes up markedly. And this was taught to you as being uh, discovered by Robert Boyle, who was one of the first of the arch plagiarists. Um, and uh, we, we could go into the history of uh, the people that he stole the idea from. However, uh, Charles Law is the other one down there, PV equals NRT. Uh, Charles actually did acknowledge where he pinched the idea from, uh, but we won't go into that. Now, if we talk to volcanologists and I'd say, well, why do these things explode? Um, they'll probably tell you, well, they're all a bit like pressure cookers. Now, I know not a lot of people necessarily have pressure cookers now, um, but uh, here is one, closed chamber, valve at the top sometimes, but a little rattling safety valve uh, sitting at the top, and you cook in there because you can elevate the pressure and get, get a better cooking rate and penetration and so forth. And if you do that on a big scale, um, in, as you did in the uh, early 1800s, unfortunately, things can go awry. Uh, so this is a, a paddle steamer on the Mississippi in 1836. And events like this were really quite common, totally destructive. And here's another one, which is a, a perfectly innocent uh, railway train, um, where either the pressure relief valve didn't work 
or um, uh, the, the materials that they made the steam engine out of weren't very good, and so it couldn't sustain the pressure, and it just went whomp. It didn't go sss, it went whomp. So if you increase the pressure on something, then you can, can, in some cases, go through the tensile strength of the rock, and once you've released it, then the whole thing uh, goes. So, pressure cookers, closed system, they got water inside boiling away to give you a vapour. So it's a two-phase system and you, ha you have external conductive heating which has no other role to play. Now volcanoes aren't like that. We've seen how we've built a picture of, of them looking like this where we have our pump of deep gases being pumped up to the surface. We have things throttling the gas flow through to the surface. It's an open system, it releases at the surface. It's gas, gas phase, heat and mass transfer is what volcanoes are all about. Now we're doing a little bit more simple physics and we talk about specific volume. Specific volume is the inverse of density. Um, it is the volume per unit mass. So down here, say there's the figure five, which in these units is five cubic centimeters per gram. As we go to lower pressures and maybe even higher temperatures, the specific volume goes up to 100 or a thousand as you get to lower and lower pressures. So something which has initially got a specific volume of five will now have a specific volume of a thousand. This should spell, spell disaster and that's what we're going to look at. So Mount St Helens would have liked, looked like this on the 17th of May 1980. It had a nice simple gas, gas phase expansion uh, through to the surface. Um, there were uh, sampleable things there, I think, um, but it was quite quiescent and, in fact, people had forgotten that St Helens was a volcano. But then the side fell off and the side falling off takes rock pressure off the gas inside. So, of course, it's going to expand very rapidly to the surface. So, the less than five cc's per gram goes to a thousand cc's per gram. So you get flank collapse um, uh, that, that then generates um, the eruption and people were killed uh, with this. But then what happens? You've now opened up your volcano so that you've created a low pressure zone which is in immediate contact with the high pressure gases. So the high pressure gases rush towards that low pressure zone. So they keep discharging, and as they discharge, so the they, you're moving to higher and higher pressure gas inside the volcano. And here is what happened to Mount St. Helens uh, a couple of days after those last pictures. It turned into a Plinaean climactic uh, eruption. And that's because of the runaway decompression of the gas phase, positive feedbacks, but really it's a good time to run away uh, when, when that happens. So now let's keep moving into another example, which is Mount Pinatubo, the second largest eruption in the 20th century. The first one was actually up in Alaska, which, which features quite a lot in these big scale eruptions. Here's a picture of it at the moment, or just after the moment of the big blast um, out of Pinatubo. Pinatubo hadn't, it hadn't uh, erupted for 500 years. Uh, it had buried some Spanish um, settlements, uh, but everybody had forgotten about it and nobody believed that it was a volcano. Uh, so its history is quite interesting. As the, the ash and gas column gets to the upper stratosphere, loses heat, it begins to, to uh, avalanche down the sides and so you get this great turbulent mass of ash and gas at temperatures of six, seven, eight hundred degrees centigrade flowing down uh, the mountain and out and around it. So do spare a thought for the guy driving uh, this vehicle and looking in his rear view mirror. Not a good scene. 
Um, so uh, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. The amount of sulfur dioxide that went in the atmosphere cooled the global atmosphere by about half a degree for a, a couple of years. There was major loss of life, and there were infrasonic and acoustic gravity waves which went around the globe, just the same as they had at Krakatoa. So these things are big things. What was happening before the eruption was there was a lot of seismic activity it was increasing in frequency. And there's a lot of attention um, paid uh, to, doing, uh, to, to looking at the patterns here. And I think Malcolm is going to spend the rest of his career trying to explain them to me. Good for you. But this was June the 12th. This was June the 14th. And this was June the 15th. So there was a lot of activity going on before the thing blew up. There had been some lesser eruptions um, in, in advance of um, the big one. But what do we think was actually happening? Well, what would have obviously been happening is when you've got a, a small seismic event, it's telling you that a fracture's moved or been formed. So there were a lot of fractures being formed to produce a network of fractures which could well look like the sort of thing we see in a, a porphyry copper, but only if the porphyry copper hasn't been blown up uh, subsequently. So, so uh, this becomes important. This is uh, Mount Pinatubo. The satellite measured how much sulfur dioxide uh, came out, and we can do various calculations on that, uh, which we won't go into too much, but um, we, can we can actually calculate, I'm happy to talk about this later on, but mostly what came out of the volcano was high, what was formerly high pressure uh, volcanic gas and lesser amount of rock material. The rock material was thrown out and left a crater uh, behind, which was two or three uh, kilometers in diameter, and continued to discharge gases, uh, as we see right there. So gases uh, are the game. Now let's start moving to Tonga. And I've deigned to say compare the pair for all of us who are on superannuation uh, schemes. Here's Pinatubo, and here's Tonga. Do they differ very much at all? This one is on land, this one is on sea, but basically we have the same kind of explosion and development of an eruptive plume. Here's the two of them again, and if we, if we plot the relative scale, this is the plume as measured for Pinatubo that got up to about 40 kilometers into, into the air and into the atmosphere. This is the kind of height that you fly by, um, and it's a good idea not to fly through one of the eruption columns uh, of, of this. This is the Tonga eruption, which got up to 54 or 56 kilometers uh, through the, the atmosphere. Um, so it's noted, I think it's noted as the biggest that has been recorded, but the thing is, we have so much more monitoring equipment around the globe now and satellites. And as we'll see, Tonga had started to erupt, so they were able to put a geostationary satellite uh, right above it, fortunately, to give you some news feed. Here's the bathymetry. It's a perfectly standard volcano before the eruption. Here it is, looking down on it. The two, it had two islands uh, and, and an area in between. After the eruption, uh, this is what it looked like. Uh, detailed uh, side scanning uh, data. Here, the original floor of this feature was about 200 meters deep. After the eruption, it was 850 meters deep. So we can have a, a rough guess of roughly how much uh, material was, was removed, about two cubic kilometers. Things about it, again, there was a lot of hyperbole about, about this eruption, mostly because of the ability to monitor things like tsunamis and sound waves better than we've ever done before. There's also suggestions that there were more lightning events uh, during uh, the eruption uh, than had ever been seen anywhere before, but I think that's been shown not necessarily uh, to be, be the case. 
The thing you hear always when, when these things uh, go off is how many million tons of TNT uh, they represent. And you can get a figure for that from the scale of the thing or from the seismic energy and so forth. So it was originally estimated to be 61 million tons of TNT. And I want you to imagine uh, what that that actually might look like, just because you don't want to trip over uh, 61 million tons of TNT. Um, if you can help it, um, it actually is more than 160,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of TNT. And I can never visualize the size of an Olympic swimming pool anyway, so let's stick with the TNT. It's subsequently, other people have looked at it and got 110 million tons of, of T, TNT. Now, the t, that is actually a measure of the energy um, that uh, was the, involved in the eruption itself, the initial explosion. Of course, the thing kept on discharging after that. Here's the seismic uh, energy as, as it went through, through the crust um, and, and picked up at various stations. Uh, along here, but you can clearly see precursor activity and then the big one, and then it sort of gently subsided back into, into sort of background. And here from the cumulative seismic energy, uh, you get a, a, a comparison of the uh, Tonga eruption energy uh, with the Pinatubo um, event in 1991. So we know a lot quantitatively and some better than, than others. And here's the, the, the sequence of events at Tonga. Uh, it's 19th to 20th of December, uh, there was a plume eruption. On the 13th and 14th of January, another plume. So it was a good idea to take your geostationary satellite in that neck of the woods. And then the 15th of January was the, the big one. And so these are the development of the, of the uh, uh, umbrella clouds. But basically a characteristic of this eruption, of Pinatubo, of Vesuvius, and all of them, is that you tend to have precursor eruptive activity. It stops and then it goes again. And I think that's because you're releasing gas and then there's the, the flow dynamics of, of gas from different parts of the volcano and so on. And I really need an applied mathematician uh, to come and work on this uh, now. Current theories, now immediately uh, everybody jumped on the idea that because it was in the ocean, uh, then seawater must have inter inter interacted with, uh, the, with magma or lava. And they, because it was big, they called it Super Sertian. Now, remember, I saw the Sertian eruption, and I can tell you this thing was a hell of a lot bigger <laughs> than, than that one. But the, the big problem with, with that idea is that you have to move about one cubic kilometer of seawater instantaneously into contact with lava. And, and get the heat transfer happening very, very fast, which seems a bit unlikely, and again could be showed by some, by some uh, uh, analytical mathematics. So we, can, we get rid of that one. Another one that's been suggested is called era collapse, where they say, well, okay, that, that uh, round feature uh, dropped. The problem with that is you've got to explain what it dropped into. You have to create a volume in order for, for that to happen. So we'll get rid of that one. And we're, we're left, of course, with my idea of a gas-driven uh, volcanic uh, explosion. And here it is. And there's the guy going, well, hmm, interesting. <laughs> so it's the mix of, of uh, gas flow, chemical reactivity, uh, et cetera. Now, just uh, we're nearly there. Just uh, at the same time, uh, there was pumice uh, erupted. Uh, which said that we did see seawater interacting with the magma. And this is a lovely, actually 3D uh, micro topography image that we took a couple of weeks ago showing how uh, the, the silica melt material had expanded as bubbles of gas came out and pulled it apart like toffee. But the neat thing about that is the very large surface area which is in contact with seawater, 
and can see organic material too. So you could actually form a surface on which you could synthesize the, ori the original uh, organic molecules for the origin of life. And I always like to think of the origin of, of life as, as how we get through to kangaroos um, rather than, uh, than us guys. Now just to finish up with, we better just look at other uh, eruptions and more particularly why do we care Okay, here's one in Redoubt Volcano, again, up in uh, Alaska. Great mushroom cloud. But we have to recognize that these things are what you call black swan events. They're rare. Now, those of us who are in Australia can't understand why you would call something rare a black swan event. It's those Europeans again. <laughs> So anyway, a black swan event, very rare, um, but uh, when they happen, you need to think about them. Here's one in 1257, um, which uh, is, is on Lombok Island in Indonesia. Um, 158 million tonnes of SO2 has been estimated, and you can do that from ice core uh, data. And a very nice piece of science, these skeletons were found in the new underground train tunnels in London and then uh, in, in the presence of ash and, and things in there. And they were able to tra trace the chemistry of the ash all the way from London to Lombok um, and then investigate all of that and put, and, and put it all together. There was a famine then because you've cooled the atmosphere, uh, you've changed uh, the, the climate, um, and so your crops uh, start to fail. Really, they start to fail because at that time, the landowners and the politicians were really squeezing the real people. Um, and so you had a nasty thing happen um, at the same time as there was political, social uh, problems anyway like having a pandemic. Then there's this one, Tambora, another one in Indonesia, uh, which uh, formed this, this, this uh, cold era um, and caused the year without summer of 1816 and the year of famine in 1817. And they were noted because uh, uh, various things happened, like Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein because she was locked away in a holiday house with some other people. Um, there was a global cholera pandemic and there were more convict ships sent to Australia, all because of, the, of the, what was then the Corn Laws in, in, uh, in Britain. So this gives us this picture. Here is the, the, uh, we see it? Here is the Tambora eruption cloud or the distribution of ash. The bigger one is one from Tobar in Sumatra, 74,000 years before that. See how big that is. And what you see is how it straddles all of our major flight routes and uh, trading routes um, and uh, most of our uh, major trading partners in this area, um, and which of course would cause major loss of life, probably famine and so forth. Um, so we should be interested. Um, You'll be pleased to know that the uh, Bureau of Meteorology maintains a volcanic ash advisory centre in Darwin, um, which is constantly using radar to, to see where aeroplanes should not fly. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. And then there's a more recent example, uh, the 2019 uh, Fakari or White Island eruption, uh, relatively small. Um, but I'll show you something about it. 22 people died in that uh, as they were on that island thinking they were having a nice time out and nine people were critically uh, injured. We looked at rocks from a similar but smaller eruption that had occurred in 2016 and I want you to notice how all the cracks in the rock sample have been filled up with two minerals. One is calcium sulfate the other one is a thing called alunite, which is a sodium uh, aluminum sulfate. Again, something that's relatively soluble and would be washed away in the end. So here's the, the, uh, the volcanic gas model uh, being shown in that particular 
case. And then when you next drive north, spare a thought from all of this. If you recognize this, this is Mount Warning, now called Wollombin, the, na the natural name, uh, which erupted 23 million years ago. Here's the satellite picture, and I don't know if you can see it here. You can see the crater, which is much like the craters that I've shown you in, in uh, uh, Tonga and, and elsewhere. And these whole surrounding areas are all stacks of, of uh, volcanic ash products. So right there, there was probably a super eruption uh, driven, of course, by the gas phase. So that's about where we can take it. We haven't even talked about the, two, the Taupo volcano eruption 1,800 years ago. Meg and I and the boys used to live beside that, and you always looked out of your bedroom window in the morning to make sure the lake was still uh, there, uh, because it goes off every 1,800 to 2,000 years. <laughs> All right? um, and we haven't talked about the one 72,000 years ago uh, which would have swamped ash right across Australia um, and so on. And we haven't even talked about Yellowstone, which is another one of the super volcanoes. Um, so um, this is me saying goodbye and it, it's the emblem that you will see on the door of the police cars in Kagoshima uh, in, in Japan because they've got a volcano on their doorstep. Thank you. moments longer. So uh, thank you, Dick, for a, a tour de force, I think, across scales, times, and disciplines, yeah. as well as globally, global um, volcanoes. And I was very pleased to see some seismograms there as well. Um, so I'm now going to um, invite questions from the audience. And those online can submit those questions via the code on their screen. There we are. Um, and those of you here, please raise your hand and uh, the mic will come to you. Do we have any questions for Dick? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk, Dick. Um, I guess I was wondering, because you were talking about the balance between pressure and volume and the pressure release can cause the runaway effects. Um, potentially could a huge downpour after a drought sort of initiate this process as it dissolves the salts that are clogging up the pores? Yeah, not on the scale that we're talking about here, but yes, and, and on a lot of volcanoes, I think it's recorded that that happens, and you get some shallow things, which uh, sometimes are called phreatic eruptions for whatever, but uh, tend to be quite small, um, but um, they can be deadly. And a lot of tourists go up volcanoes like um, Mayon in, in Philippines, and were killed because of those small kind of eruptions. Um, the one on Krakatoa that I showed you, it may have been after some rain event that was getting in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not the big sustained things, I don't think we're talking about. Yeah, ta. Yeah. Thank you. There's one, one here, please. Uh, when you said that copper's found in the volcanic cone, does that mean copper's always in the magma and the gases that comes through? Ah, well, that's, a, that's an interesting sort of question. Um, and the guy who could answer it is sat right over there, <laughs> uh, Ian Campbell, who received the medal here just a little while ago. Um, uh, he's been looking in detail at the trace element chemistry of uh, magmas, and trying to track back on that. We, we, we can turn your question around by, by sort of saying, should every eroded volcano 
have a porphyry copper deposit in it? And the answer is, well, well the observation is no, they don't. But very often you find copper iron sulphides in volcanic rocks, just small amounts. So it seems like there's, there is an amount of metal coming through, but only in particular places do you, uh, is, is the mafic magma development associated with a higher uh, than, than average uh, copper and gold um, composition. That would be right, wouldn't it, Ian? Pretty much. Yeah. Ian. People online here. I'm sorry, we work on different parts of the same yeah. event. I'm looking at the, at the melt, you're looking at, at the gas, and the copper goes from the melt to the gas, and the gas then reacts with the rocks, as you say, and then that forms the deposit. Mm. But I think most volcanoes have some copper, mm. but you need a very big volcano or a very big system to form something that you can mine. So it's the size that is all important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a sort of yes. <laughs> yeah. And you got two responders to your question there. So yes, Wendy's got a, a question from online. Yes, we do. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. Good evening, everyone. I'm Wendy Waquella. I'm the Communications Manager at the Academy of Science. Um, we've got a question from Tony, who's watching from Ngunnawal Country in Canberra. Um, you've got two questions from him, actually. The first is, what is the possibility of a volcano in Australia becoming active? Um, and the second one is, and I'm glad to reiterate later if, you, if you'd like, the second is, are there any currently unknown crystals or gemstones that could exist underground that may become highly prized? <laughs> <laughs> two, two simple questions for um, you there. The, the second one I'll leave to, to petrological people. Um, uh, the first one is about volcanism in Australia. Um, and there are a couple of provinces which uh, are notable. Um, there was one, uh, there's the, the volcanic, there's the uh, lake district in Victoria, uh, which was thought to have been um, uh, active during the time of the First Nations people. Um, uh, and Maybe that is so, but recent dating has suggested that, that those volcanoes were about a million or a little bit bigger, uh, longer ago. More recently, uh, up in the, the Atherton Tablelands, it was always known that there's basalt um, uh, vents there, um, and they uh, have been dated, I think, at around 5,000 years ago. So that's not long ago. Uh, whether you think that may suggest that they could go off again is is a bit uh, moot and we can't answer that. Um, they tend to be relatively small uh, er eruptions. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that would be my answer to the first part, but not to the second part. Thank you, Dick. Um, over the back, please. me. Um, you teased me when you said that volcanoes can also be creative in terms of biochemistry. And I'm trying to get my mind around how that would work. As such a destructive, speedy event leads to the creation of complex biochemicals, which I would have thought would take longer. Are you able to elaborate? Yeah, we can, we can pursue that. I mean, um, uh there, there is a theory um, that um, the best chance of, of forming life molecules, let's say, which are complex molecules, is if you can get organics bumping into each other on a surface. In three, dimensional, three dimensions, it's harder for them to bump into each other. But on a surface, where, they're maybe absorbed, where the liquid phase is absorbed on the surface, then you've got a greater chance of, of synthesizing um, bio-organic uh, molecules. So in the, in the case here, the, what, what the eruption did was it produced this expanded, lightweight, floating pumice material in seawater 
it's porous and so it can have a wetting layer which can pick up organics from wherever. So it does form a, a potential surface in which these kind of interactions may happen. Somebody at Oxford has published on that just recently um, with a lot more detail than that. So, yeah, and, the, and pumice formation would have been occurring right from the start of the earth. Right? Uh, pumice is quite, is, well, you use it for cleaning dry skin off, um, but, but it, it wears out going around the ocean onto beaches and, and, and so forth. So, it, again, it's a sort of ghost material in the geological record. Um, so, yeah. So I'm sure the questions could go on for another hour, but I think I do have to, we've used our 10 minutes of interrogation of you, Dick, and I know there are some uh, refreshments next door, so I think I should bring the formal part to a close. I'd like to thank you all for your questions, both in, the, uh, in Canberra and online. Um, and it remains for me to once again uh, thank Dick and congratulations on his award. Now, I'd like to invite all those here in the Shine Dome to join us in the Jager Room for some refreshments. And um, thank you and good evening. <laughs>